I have an announcement. So our website is finally up and we are open for membership. We've had a lot of people that have been watching us online that have been wanting to join our church. So now our online registration is available on our website. It is prophecyministries.org. Go there, register. That's going to be great. In addition to that, we also have created a private Facebook group just for our members. It's our own version of Facebook, so you can use your account to log in. There's lots of pictures and videos, and it's a great place to chat and get encouragement from other members of Prophecy Ministries. Amen? Give me that background, Tom, and show them what we are talking about tonight. Discovering the identity of the two witnesses. She said, oh, this is going to be good. Okay, so let's get into this. The, the Bible explains that in the end times, during the great tribulation, that there are going to be two witnesses. And so many people have different ideas about who the witnesses are. I have heard crazy stuff. Even as far as somebody saying, well, the two witnesses are the Jews and the Gentiles. Really? The Bible tells you exactly who the two witnesses are, and we're going to discover their identity beyond a shadow of a doubt. I've heard people say, oh, well, it's Enoch, because Enoch never died. Yeah, that's true. Enoch never died, but he's not one of the witnesses. Enoch was translated. What's he going to do? Untranslate back to a man and come to earth so he can preach the gospel? One of the first things that we have to get into regarding the great tribulation is how long it is. Last week, I put out a video, and it's, it's one of our most popular videos right now. It's called, They Lied to You About the Great Tribulation, because most people think that it's for how long? Seven, Seven years. And how long is it really? Three and a half years. We're going to take a look at a string of verses very quickly that is going to prove the exact amount of time. I've heard people try to explain it and say that the first three and a half, because you guys know three and a half and three and a half equals what? Okay, they say the first three and a half is the tribulation and the second three and a half is the great tribulation. And I say what I always say when somebody says something crazy. What do I say? Show me in the scriptures where it says that because it does not say that. Like I was probably from Missouri in a previous life. You guys know that's the show me state, right? Okay, let's get into these scriptures. Give me Revelation chapter 11 and let's take a look at verse 3. The scripture says, and I... That's the most high will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, we're going to understand this verse in the reverse order. We are going to uh, construct it in the reverse. Why are they clothed in sackcloth? What does sackcloth represent? Humility. So are they going to come as these big bad servants of the most high throwing lightning bolts? No, they're, they're going to be humble. They're going to be in sackcloth. They're going to be just like you and me. In fact, it could be you or me. It says, and they're going to prophesy 1,203 score days. The complicated part in that is the three score. So first, how long is a score? 20 is, a, a score is 20. So three score is how long? And then add 1,200 to that. And what do we have? 1,260. Okay, now here's our compound math. Now divide that by 30. You're going to get exactly three and a half years. Why by 30? Because Hebrew months have exactly 30 days. We don't have those funny months that have 28 days and 31 over here. So 1,260 days is exactly three and a half years using a Hebrew calendar. Okay, so the witnesses are going to prophesy during the great tribulation. Let me show you Revelation chapter 12 and give me verse 6 real quick. This is the exact same amount of time that we, the children of Israel, who saw the signs, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Where do we go when we see that? We go to the, we go to the wilderness. We flee out of the city because there's going to be problems in the city. That's the same amount of time that we do that. Now watch Revelation chapter 12, verse six says, and the woman, who's the woman? Israel is the woman. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of Yah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's the same number we read before, right? So she's going to go into the wilderness and receive food in the wilderness for 1,200 
and three score days, three and a half years. Why does she need to be fed in the wilderness? What's happening in the city? They are enforcing the mark of the beast. What does the mark of the beast prevent you from doing? So if you can't buy and you can't sell, guess what else you can't do? You can't eat. So that's going to be a difficult situation. There's going to be a time of famine unless you flee out of the places where they are enforcing the mark of the beast into the place where a place is prepared. Does that make sense? Okay, now watch. This is exactly the same amount of time that the Antichrist will reign. Give me Daniel chapter 7. Let's take a look at verse 25. This scripture is specifically referring to the Antichrist, the little horn. It says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. What is he going to change? Times and laws. Okay. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. How long is that? That's exactly three and a half years. So he has reign on the earth to do whatever he wants. And what he wants to do is change the time and change the laws. Why? Because the most high sits on the outside of time, proving that he knows the end from the very beginning. Right? So Satan, of course, he wants to do that same thing. So he's like, I'm just going to change the time. So the children of Israel don't know what time it is. If you don't know what time it is, then you'll get caught off guard by the great tribulation. If you think it's seven, Oh, you're going to show up late. <laughs> you're going to show up late and it's going to be very difficult for you to survive during that time. Because Christ said, when you see this thing, you need to flee. So you should be looking out for the thing that he said that you should be looking out for so that you know when to flee. It says, and they shall be given into his hand for until the time and times and the dividing of time. So, so far we have three things. We have the two witnesses. They're going to prophesy during the great tribulation for exactly three and a half years. What else? Israel, those that are awakened, we have to flee into a place where we can actually eat some food. That place is prepared for exactly three and a half years. Why? Because during those three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to be doing whatever it is that he wants to do. This is the same amount of time that when Daniel asks Yahawashai about the end, this is exactly what Yahawashai spoke to him. Give me Daniel chapter 12, verse 6. I'm going to let you guys in on a mystery when you're reading in the book of Daniel. Also, I believe in the book of Ezekiel. There is a character and his identification is based on his clothing. Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 says, And one said to the man clothed in linen, that's his identification. What is he clothed in? Who is it? It's Yahweh Shai. When he comes back, what is he wearing? Fine linen and white. And what happens to it? It gets turned red. Okay. But when he comes, so when you're reading this prophecy in Daniel and it tells you about the man clothed in linen, Daniel is seeing the Messiah and talking with him. But he's not referring to him as the Messiah. He's referring to him based off of what he sees. Prophets usually are very visual people because the Most High reveals something to them that they need to see. Now take a look. It says, and one, that's one of the angels, said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Let's see what he answers. Give me verse seven. He says, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. Where's he standing at? He's standing on the water. He is sea walking right there in front of us. Okay. It says, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. How long is that? That's three and a half. And when he does the most high shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. He said, when Israel is completely scattered and there is no more power or might in their hand to save themselves. That's when this thing is going to be done. Cause that's when they're going to realize that they need a redeemer. They need a savior. They cannot save themselves. Have you guys ever heard this? Um, God's opportunity is at the end of men's extremity. That means you're going to stretch your hand as far as you can stretch it. And he's going to start to work once you can't do anymore. He expects you to do everything that you can do in the power that you have. And what you can't do, 
He is a God of the impossible, so he will do all the rest. He says, you walk around that problem seven times and don't say nothing about the problem. You just walk around. And when you're tired, when you get to the end of your strength, then I'm going to show up and do the rest of the work. Does that make sense? Okay. So three and a half years. Now, this is the same amount of time using a modern day Julian calendar. Let me show you this last verse. Give me Daniel chapter 12 verse. Jump to verse 11. It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there should be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. How many days difference is that? That's 30 days difference. Why? Because this is a modern Julian calendar. Now, when he says uh, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, what do you guys remember about that abomination of desolation? That's, that's our go signal, ain't it? When we see that thing happen, we are supposed to go immediately because that is the beginning. He says there shall be 1,290 days from the time that you see that thing happen to the end. That's exactly three and a half years using a modern day calendar. Okay, let's talk more about these two witnesses. Take me back to Revelation chapter 11 and give me verse four. The scripture says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Yah of the earth, before the Allah of the earth. How are they described? What are they? They're two what? Uh, what are they first? They're olive trees and they're also, and where do they stand? They're standing in the presence of the Most High. Let's get into these scriptures. Give me Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. I want to remind you that all of the prophets saw the same thing. They all described it in their unique way. Kind of like the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and that other guy. What's his name? John. Okay, that guy. They all saw the same thing, but they all described what they saw based on their own perspective, their own occupation, their own background. All of these prophets saw the same thing. So Daniel saw the same thing that Zechariah saw, saw the same thing that John the Revelator saw, but they're all going to describe it slightly differently. That's the reason why you must understand the precepts, because it may say one thing here and you'll have to flip way over here to find out what that thing means. This is why we study the scriptures precept upon precept, precept upon precept, and here a little, and there a little. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 1, watch it says, and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Now here's the interesting thing. Every prophet was sleeping with the exception of Moses. The, the angel comes and the one that talked with him before, he awakened him out of his sleep, but he is still sleeping. He awakened him out of his regular sleep and put him into a vision. The scripture says, when does the most high speak to you? In visions, when you're sleeping upon your bed, that's when he seals your instructions. Okay, give me verse two. Let's find out what this angel says. Zechariah chapter four, verse two, it says, and he said unto me, what seest thou? Pause there for a second. A lot of times we are waiting for the most high to tell us something. Please speak to me, speak to me, speak to me as if he's limited to only using words. Words is only one representational type. What if the thing that you're expecting him to say by an audible voice, he has been showing you for years. You just, you're not getting it because you want it your way, but it ain't Burger King. You want it your way and he's giving it to you his way. That happens all the time. What if I'm expecting to see something, but I keep getting overwhelmed with this feeling? Feeling is one of the ways that the Most High speaks to you. He'll speak on the inside of you. Sometimes with an audible voice, sometimes with something that you can see, sometimes with something that you can feel. What is this? How's he speaking in this verse? It says, and said unto me, what seest thou? So he's showing him a picture. Ain't that right? Okay. It says, and I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of all gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Let me show you what it looked like. What did he see? 
He saw, he saw one of these. He just described what one of these is. It's a candlestick, right? Okay, give me the next verse, verse 3. What did he see? He saw a candlestick, and then verse 3 it says, and two olive trees. Where are these olive trees at? They're by it. Okay, now, you, we read Revelations many times. We did a whole year-long study on Revelation. What are the candlesticks? What is it? The candlesticks are the seven churches. Candles, who's in the middle of the candlesticks? Christ is in the middle. So there's Christ. He's in the middle. And then what's next to him? Two olive trees by it. I want you to know that what is being seen right now was also seen at the transfiguration. Remember what happened at the transfiguration? Who was there? We had Yahawashai and, and Moses and, and Elijah. Okay. So that's giving you a glimpse into who the two witnesses are. It says, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Give me verse four. It says, so I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? He don't know what they are. Give me the next verse. Watch what the angel responds. He says, then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? <laughs> Why he talks like that? <laughs> you don't know what these be, homie? <laughs> and I said, no, my Lord. So he says, you ought to know because you're looking at them. You should be able to see them. You should be able to identify them. But because you don't know what they are, let me tell you. Verse six. Then he answered and said unto me, saying, this is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith Yahweh Sabaoth. Okay, so he's looking at these two olive trees, and he says, I don't really know what those are. I, 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 don't, I can't identify them. What are they? And he says, this is the fulfillment of the word, that this thing is not going to happen by might. It's not going to happen by power. It's going to happen by my spirit. Now watch, this part is very important because we covered this recently. Uh, who remembers what the spirit is? The spirit is the word. The spirit goes beyond understanding. The spirit goes beyond the physical level. See, when he's talking, he says, by might, that's a physical thing. Power, what's that? That's a physical thing. He says, no, this is by my spirit. Because these two olive trees are two people. Two people that have lived and two people that are coming back. Watch this. So it says that they stand before the God of the whole earth. Give me Exodus chapter 33, verse 21. We're just going to do some investigating and find out who the scripture says is standing before Yah. Exodus chapter 33, verse 21, it says, And Yahweh said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt do what? Who's he talking to? He's talking to Moses, and what did he tell Moses to do? Stand on the rock. He said, there's a place by me and I want you to stand. What is he going to do? Anybody know this part? He's going to pass by him. So what is Moses doing while the most high is passing by? He's standing before the God of the whole earth. Give me verse 22. He says, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by. What did Moses want to see? You guys remember? He says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Give me this verse 23 real quick. And he says, and I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Okay. So he says, the most high says, there's a place by me and I want you to stand there. You're going to stand there before me and I'm going to cause all my glory to pass by you. So did does Moses fit the description of one of these witnesses? Because he has to stand before the God of the whole earth. Okay, let's find out. Uh, give me 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. The scripture says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As Yahweh Allahayim of Yasharala liveth, before whom I... Wait, he says, I stand. I stand in front of him. Okay, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. What did he say that he does? He said that he stands before the Most High. So 
Moses, we saw a verse that says Moses stands before him. We just saw a verse that says Elijah stands before him. Take me back to that revelation, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 4. Let's see if those two match the description. Give me verse 4 real quick. These are the two olive trees. Did we see that they're the olive trees? Okay. And the two candlesticks. Did we see that they are the candlesticks? Where does it say that they're standing? Before the Yah of the earth. Okay, we've seen every piece and part of that verse. Take me to verse 5 real quick now. It says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So the two witnesses are going to be able to kill men. Isn't that right? That's what it says, right? How are they going to kill them? With fire. They're going to kill them with fire. Okay, let's see if the two witnesses that I have proposed, Moses and Elijah, let's see if they fit the bill. Give me 2 Kings chapter 1. Let's take a look at verse 10. The scripture says, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50. Do you guys know this story? <laughs> I love this story. He says, If I be a man of Yah, then let what? Fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And then what happened? And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So he, you guys, you, you, you guys know what I say. If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. Okay, so, so far it's walking and talking really well right here. Okay, let's find out what this fire is. Give me Jeremiah 23 verse 29. Look at what the Most High says. Is not my word like as a fire, saith Yahweh, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? So these two witnesses, they're going to speak fire. But what is the fire actually? They're going to speak the word. They're, they're going to do it the same way that Yahweh Shai is going to do it when he comes back. Give me Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Watch this. It says, Wherefore thus saith Yahweh Allahayim of Sabaoth, Because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. And this people would <laughs> wait if the word that I'm speaking is fire and he turns you into wood. What's going to happen? It says, and it shall devour them. See, all the prophets saw the same thing. You don't realize what the scripture is writing about until you start to study the precepts. The scripture says, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have more wisdom than all my teachers. That's what the scripture says. That's not me. The scripture says I have more wisdom than all my teachers. Why? Because I keep the precepts. All right. Take me back to Revelation chapter 11. Let's look at verse 6. So we found out that these two, they can spit fire. Verse 6 says, these have power to do what? Shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now that is giving you a throwback so that you'll figure out who these two people are. Because in the time of their prophecy, when they prophesied the first time, they shut the heavens and it did not rain. It says, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who fits that bill? Think about it. Everybody you know in the scriptures. Moses did that, right? He turned the water into blood, right? Let's, let's see. Um, take me back. Watch. Give me. First Kings chapter 17, verse one. We read this verse earlier. I want you to see what he's talking about. Again, you might have missed it. It says, and Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as Yahweh, as Yahweh Allahayim of Yasharala liveth before whom I stand. You guys remember that part, right? Look what he does. There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. What did, he, what did he do? He said, I stand before the most high and it's not about to rain. What was he doing? He shut the heavens. Who knows how long he shut them for? It's a secret. The Bible tells you exactly how long he shut the heavens for. And it's a picture of the great tribulation. Now, how long is the great tribulation? How long do you think he shut the heavens for? That's amazing, right? That's, that's not a coincidence that he did that. I'm going to show you that. Watch. Give me James chapter 5, verse 17. The scripture says, Elias. Who's Elias? Well, how come it says Elias on the screen? Because it's in Greek. Elijah. All the names that have an A-H at the end in Hebrew have an A-S at the end. So Jeremiah becomes Jeremiah. Okay? 
Elias, that's Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. It doesn't say that in Kings. Did you guys know that? Where we were reading in Kings, it does not tell you that. You must keep the precepts and find this precept here a little and there a little in order for you to answer that mystery, in order for you to see that picture. Watch. Give me Luke chapter 4, verse 25. Luke chapter 4, verse 25. He says, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the day of Elias. When the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. Two precepts. In the mouth of what? How many witnesses do I need? Two or three. Okay, so clearly one of the witnesses has the ability to shut the heavens so it does not rain. What does the other witness have the power to do? Turn water into blood. Give me Exodus chapter 4. Let's take a look at verse 9. What I'm doing in this message is showing you the power of the precepts, because if you have a question, the word is living. You'll be able to answer your question according to the word. You won't have to make up stuff and be like, I think one of the witnesses is, um, is Judas and uh, the other one might be just making up anything. You don't have to make up stuff. The Bible tells you who they are. It answers all of your questions. Exodus chapter four, verse nine, it says, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou tookest out of the river shall become blood on the dry land. That's Moses, right? Let's take a look at it again. Give me Exodus chapter 7, verse 17. Scripture says, thus saith Yahweh, in this thou shalt know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in thine hand. I, wanna, I want you to point, I want you to see something in that. Who's going to do it? He's, he says, I, who's speaking? Yahweh is speaking and he says, I'm going to do it with the rod that's in your hand. What does that mean? He's going to use Moses to fulfill his will, but he's still the one that's doing it. It says, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters, which are in the river. And what's going to happen to them? Okay, they're going to turn into blood. Let's take a let's, Now, you guys are seeing this, right? There is nobody else walking and quacking except for these two. These guys fit all the requirements to be the two witnesses. Let's take a look at the transfiguration. Give me Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. The scripture says, And after six days, Yahawashai taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Give me this next verse, verse 2. It says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So what happened? He said, you, the rest of y'all go to the market and James and where your brother, John. Okay. Peter, you guys come with me. We're going on a hike. <laughs> and they went up to a high mountain. And what happened when they got to the top of the mountain? Ooh, how shy you look different. <laughs> your face, your face look different. Where you get that white suit? That white suit is real nice. He was transfigured. They saw a glimpse of him as his translated self. Okay, now here's the crazy part. That part you would expect to happen, right? Give me verse three. It says, and behold, there appeared unto them. Who? And what they doing? They're talking. Okay, so there's no doubt at this point who the witnesses are because they're having a private convo. I want you to see the fact that both Moses is dead and Elijah is dead. You guys see that, right? But James, John, and Peter are seeing Moses and Elijah speaking with the Messiah. How does that happening? It's not happening by might. It's not happening by power. What's it? Ha it's happening by his spirit. Does that make sense? Everybody able to see that? Okay, watch this. Give me a uh, verse four real quick. Peter, Peter always messing up. 
Peter always messing up. I would have, I probably would have messed up too. I'd be like, bro, you see that? That's Moses. I didn't think he looked like that. I probably would have messed up too. But Peter need to put his hand on his mouth because he interrupts the whole conversation that they're having. It says, then answered Peter and said unto you, how was shy? Adonai, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He don't know what to say, does he? He's just coming up with anything. What they need tabernacles for. They're not staying. Nobody knew what to say. And Peter was like, you say something. You say, I'm not going to say nothing. You say, uh, yeah, look here, Jesus. Um, <laughs> he started making up stuff, right? <laughs> Give me Matthew chapter 11, verse 13. Is it so hard to believe that Moses is going to come back? Where, where did Moses' body go? Where? The Most High himself buried Moses' body. Satan had a dispute with Michael over the location of Moses' body because he wanted it. Because if he can get the body, he can probably prevent him from coming back. Moses knows, or Satan knows that Moses is going to come back. Okay. Is it so hard to believe that Elijah is going to come back? Most people think that Elijah never died. Why? Because he got taken up into the heavens. What happened eight years later after he got taken into the heavens? He wrote a letter. He wrote a letter from, from where? Heaven? <laughs> he just threw it down there, just wrote it up and just folded it. It's like, Phew. no, that's not what happened. So he got lifted up into the heaven. How many heavens are there? Three heavens. All of them are called Shamaim. He got lifted up into the first heaven and transported to a different location and sat down there. Why? His ministry was finished. He had just passed the mantle unto his protege, Elisha, and he was done. But during the time of Elisha's prophesying, Elijah wrote a letter to the king proving that he was still on the earth. Okay, um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 13. Look at what Yahabashai says here. He says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until when? Until John. Okay, all the prophets and the law prophesied up until John. John who? John the Baptist. Watch what he says next. Give me verse 14. It says, and if ye will receive it, this is who? This is Elijah, which was for to come. Who did, he, who did Yehoshua just say that John the Baptist was? He just said it was Elijah. Okay, but is everybody going to be able to receive that? No, he said, if you will receive it. And then he drops this bombshell in the next verse. Give me the next verse. Verse 15, he says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He just told you a mystery that the spirit of Elijah is in John the Baptist. It has to be because there is a dual prophecy concerning Elijah. The Bible tells you in the book of Malachi that he has to come twice. You will only see that if you know how to rightly divide the word. If you're just reading it like it's a comic book or the funny pages, <laughs> you're just reading it like it's a, the yellow pages, you're going to miss it. You're not going to be able to see it. I'm going to show it to you in a little bit so that you can see it for yourself. Take me back real quick to Revelation chapter 11. We're at verse 7 now. I want to ask you guys a quick question. Why out of all the people, like how come he didn't pick David? How come he didn't pick Isaiah? How come he didn't pick Daniel? Why specifically did he pick for his two witnesses, Moses and Elijah? Go. Oh, man, y'all, y'all so good. So good. Because Moses, what did he do? He represents the law. And Elijah represents what? The testimony. Okay. And without the law and the testimony, if I don't speak according to that, what does that mean? There's no light in me if I don't speak according to that. Okay. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. They're going to die. Ain't that right? They're going to die. That's kind of hard for some people. They're going to die. What are they going to do until the time that they die? What does it say? And when they shall have finished their testimony. What is their testimony? What is your testimony? What is your testimony? Let me, let me give it to you in a nutshell. See, I was filthy. 
I didn't deserve anything. I was in my sins. But the son of the most high came down and took my place. He died in my place so that I didn't have to die and I didn't have to sacrifice any more animals. He, in what he did, reconciled me back to the father through his death and through his resurrection. That's my testimony. If you want to know anything about me, that's what, that's the whole story. I was filthy and I was guilty, but now I'm good. Got it? And when they shall have finished their testimony, the testimony is the gospel. That's the only thing. The only reason why you're standing here breathing, like none of us deserve this breath that we are consuming right now. The only reason why any of us are here breathing is because of the gospel, because of what he did, because he gave you a second chance to repent for your sins. Give me Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The scripture says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. See, Israel requires what? Israel requires a sign. I can try and show you the scriptures. I can break them down real cool. I can slap together 15 different precepts. Israel's still not going to believe. So what do we need to do? We need to have somebody come from the dead who knows the scripture perfectly who's able to speak fire and that will wake up Israel. But see, it's also going to test Israel's faith because these men that they're going to start to put their trust in that are breaking down these scriptures that are saying, yeah, you are the biblical Israelites and you got to keep the law and you got to have the testimony. What happens when the beast comes out of the bottomless pit? He kills them. What happens to the people's faith who put faith in those two men instead of in the most high? Their faith is crushed. So that's going to be a big time test of people's faith because the thing that made you believe just got ripped out from under you. Well, that's exactly what happened. You just got to see that's a picture of what happened with the Messiah. But our faith was in the right place. See, we believed in him and then he died. But what happened after he died? He resurrected. OK, so if it's a picture, what happens after they die? They're going to come back and they're going to resurrect again. Take me back to Revelation chapter 11 and let's see verse 8. It says, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. What's the great city? Jerusalem is the great city. It says, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. We're not going to get into that right now because there's children present. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. Where also our Adonai was crucified. So they're the, their bodies are going to lay in the streets for how long? Three days? Three days don't fit the picture. Three days don't fit the picture. Who, who knows how long? Three and a half days. That fits the picture, don't it? Okay, watch. Give me verse nine. Everything in the Bible is pictures. You've got to learn to see the pictures in order to understand it. And they of the people and kindreds, and tongues, and nations, shall see their dead bodies for how long? Three days and a half. That's a small picture of the big picture, the three and a half years. Are they going to bury them? It says, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. That's Moses right there. He dead. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be taking out our cell phone, taking pictures with his dead body. You know how people do. They're crazy. Give me... Give me Psalms chapter 79, verse 1, because this is prophesied. David was also a prophet, and all the prophets saw the same thing. Psalm 79, verse 1, it says, O oh, Yah, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. This happens during the time of the great tribulation. Give me this next verse. Verse 2, it says, it says, the dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven. What does that mean? Did they bury them? Nope. They just let the birds eat them. The flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Now give me verse three. It says their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem and there was none to bury them. That's the power of the precepts. You didn't know when you were reading Psalms that David was telling you a picture of what's going to happen to Moses and Elijah thousands of years in the future when they die, that they're going to prophesy and be killed and nobody's going to bury them. Take me back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. I got to start wrapping it up. Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. It says, 
And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them after they're dead. That's what it means. And make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Because these two, what are they? Were they called prophets before? They haven't been called prophets. Have they been called prophets before? Whom? He says, because these two prophets. So what are they? They're, they're the candlesticks. They're the olive trees. And they are the prophets. Tormented them that dwell on the earth. Let's see if, if, this, if we can make this part line up. Give me Deuteronomy 34 verse 10. Let's find out if Moses was a prophet. The scripture says, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses. Was he a prophet? He was, there was no prophet like him. It says, whom Yahweh knew face to face. Okay, give me Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. This is the scripture that I want you to see. You have to learn to rightly divide the word. Because if you read it too fast, you're going to miss it. Watch, I'll read it fast. It says, Behold, I, was, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Wait, what? You're going you're gonna to send who? You're going to send Elijah. When? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. How many, how many times are in there? The great and the dreadful. So what was the great day? The great day was when he was born. Who came before he was born? Before Yahweh Shai was born? John the Baptist came. Who did, who did Yahweh Shai say that John the Baptist was? Okay, so that fulfills part of the prophecy. It says, I will send you Elijah before the coming of the great. That's the first day. And dreadful. That's a whole different day. When is that dreadful day? That's the three and a half year tribulation. Who has to come before Yahweh Shai comes? Elijah has to come twice. Everybody able to see that? Okay. Yeah. This is the reason why we studied the scriptures to be able to rightly divide them. Give me Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. <laughs> and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from Yah entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. What entered into them? The spirit, because it's not by might and it's not by power. It's by the spirit. This is a picture of the dry bones, the valley of the dry bones. Because what happens to get the dry bones to stand on their feet? The spirit enters into them. Give me Ezekiel 37 verse 14. You guys with me? Okay. Anybody here still think that it's somebody like Popeye and, and no, the two witnesses, just any random people. You're like, I think it's Tony the Tiger just making up stuff. It is clearly Elijah and Moses. Ezekiel 37 verse 14. And I shall put my what? My spirit in you and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, saith Yahweh. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit. What is this spirit that I keep talking about? It's the word. Am I going too fast? You guys getting finger cramps? You guys writing these? You guys writing some notes? Hands getting tired? Give me John chapter 6 verse 63. Let's look at the spirit. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. What does quicken mean? It's the spirit that brings to life. We just saw that in Ezekiel. We just saw that in Revelation. Now we're seeing the precept that brings it all together. It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's what he meant when he said it's not by power. It's not by might. It's by the spirit. It's according. Look, he's the author and finisher of our salvation, of our faith. He, he can just say it and it's done. Take me back to Revelation chapter 11. Give me verse 12. Now let's see their resurrection. It says, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. How, do you guys know this picture is in the scriptures so that you know what your, tr your uh, translation is going to be like. What, what happened to them is going to happen to you if you continue to walk in the law and the testimony. If you continue to walk in spirit and truth. If you continue to walk in faith and works. 
Give me one last scripture. I'm going to wrap it up. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. The scripture says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, does it say words? It says word. Why does it say word? Because the law and the testimony is the word. It's not words. It's one thing. It is because there is no light in them. Wherever it is that you were going to church, wherever it, whoever it is that is teaching you the Bible, they need to be teaching you one thing, which is actually two things. What is it? The law and the testimony. Amen. This is the message that I have for you tonight.